Have you played daily fantasy sports and had no idea what you're doing? Have you set your lineups not knowing how to fully optimize it? Draft Dashboard's Daily Fantasy Sports Optimizer saves you a ton of research and time building optimized winning daily fantasy sports lineups. Draft Dashboard Daily Fantasy Tools show players with the best value, optimal stats, defensive matchups, and so much more. Use Draft Dashboard's Daily Fantasy Sports Lineup Optimizer for just $1 and skyrocket your daily fantasy success playing at sites like DraftKings and FanDuel. Works with NFL, NBA, MLB, and NHL. Just go to DraftDashboard.net and fully optimize your lineups for just $1. Go to DraftDashboard.net today. And look at it go! He could go all the way! Touchdown! 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 The Bills make me wanna shout! Kick your heels up and shout! Throw your hands up and shout! Throw your head back and shout! But come on now! The Bills are making it happen now! Stand up now, come on and shout! Yeah, 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 yeah! Shout it right! Bills Fanatics, we are back with another edition of the Build Up Podcast. I am your host, Fern Bannatine. And today we are going to discuss anything and everything related to week three of the Bills season when we take on the Cincinnati Bengals. It is our home opener. And all things considered, I think this season has gotten off to an ideal as start as possible. Of course, after two weeks, the Bills are 2-0 and with two big road wins, including one divisional win. Since the season started, knock on wood, we've managed to escape any real uh, concerning type of injury. And probably most importantly, we have a young quarterback who is starting to really look like the franchise quarterback that we all hope he can become. In that week two win over the Giants, our quarterback Josh Allen once again looked fairly accurate like he did in the first game of the season. And this time he limited those turnovers, didn't turn the ball over at once. Now, he wasn't perfect in this game. He did miss a few throws that could have been bigger gains than they ended up being. Uh, We're going to talk a little bit about Josh Allen's development and his expectations a little later on. But all things considered, I don't think we could have gotten off to a better start in all facets of the game like we have. And now it's time to get ready for week three of the season. And we are going to talk about what we should expect during this game over the course of this week's episode. But firstly, I just want to go over a few things that need to be said about our Week 2 win over the New York Giants. Again, I thought we played a very clean game. We gave up that early touchdown on the Giants' first drive when Saquon Barkley ran all over the place. He's going to do that. He's going to make his plays. But after that drive, we also drove down the field ourselves, got ourselves a nice comfortable 21-7 lead. And then with that lead uh, through the end of the first half and into the second half, we played a fairly conservative game. And I have no problem with us being a little conservative with the lead. I've heard some criticism about Sean McDermott not having a killer instinct. But I think when you're on the road with the lead, you have to remember what the bottom line is. And you just want to get out of there with the W, uh, however that may be. And it's not always pretty. So even at the end of the first half, when we had an opportunity to maybe drive down the field in the last uh, 40 seconds or so, And we took the knee. You know, at first I was yelling at my TV a little bit about us being so conservative. Uh, Quite often in circumstances like this, I find myself asking uh, what Bill Belichick would do if if he was facing the same situation. Uh, But then in retrospect, I realized that that might not be fair because Bill Belichick has Tom Brady at the helm, whereas we have a second-year quarterback who's still prone to some mistakes and some boneheaded plays. So yeah, in retrospect, I I have no problem with Sean McDermott taking the knee there uh, near the end of the first half. That leads nicely into uh, touching on Josh Allen and what we saw from him in this second game of the season. Like I sort of alluded to, I'm very excited about what I see from him so far in this second season and so far as improvement goes, especially with accuracy and ball placement. There were quite a few impressive throws throughout this game, but the one that really stands out to me is that down midway through the first half when he was flushed out of the pocket and hit hit Dawson Knox on the run across his body with a perfect strike. Uh, there's no other way to put it. It was, it was a perfect play. He, there's no better way he could have made that play happen. And otherwise, he was spreading the ball around to many different receivers, finding the open man, going through his reads. Again, I was very encouraged in this week two game that he managed not to make one of those kind of boneheaded, try to be the hero type throws. 
where he throws off his back foot or under pressure into coverage. He limited those mistakes and he has to keep doing this going forward. No, I'm not going to say that Mr. Allen was perfect in this game. There were a few inaccurate throws. Uh, that deep ball to John Brown when he overthrew John Brown. Didn't think that was possible in the first half. In the third quarter, there was an opportunity to hit Zay Jones with a slant pattern. Unfortunately, Josh Allen threw the ball behind him. So even though those were uh, more few and far between than we're used to, uh, I think we should have high expectations for our second-year quarterback, even at this stage. Uh, just because if you look around the league, some of the other y- brilliant young quarterbacks, you look at Pat Mahomes, uh, Deshaun Watson, Carson Wentz. If we want to keep up with them, then we should expect excellence from our quarterback as well. You may be able to get away with not capitalizing on those opportunities against these Jets and Giants teams. But if we're going to go into Kansas City, say, in the playoffs, uh, (laughs) by that point, we're going to have to be capitalizing. And maybe those are high expectations, but that's the way I'm thinking. If we're going to win playoff games, what we need to see from Josh Allen. Uh, But ultimately, I'm very impressed so far with how much better he looks this year in his second year. The game's really slowing down for him, but there's just a few things that he's going to have to work on, just capitalizing a little better, and of course, keeping those boneheaded plays to a minimum. So I also wanted to touch on this whole uh, right tackle flip-flop that Sean McDermott's been doing, where he's been interchanging Cody Ford and Ty Niseki uh, during these football games. I saw an interesting stat recently, uh, whereby... Uh, Ty Niseki has been our right tackle on five of our six touchdown drives so far over the first two weeks of the season. And even if you glance at the game with your naked eye, you can see that Cody Ford is struggling out there. There were a few plays in the first half where he was beat pretty cleanly. Uh, He had a few costly penalties as well. Of course, one of them was when he was defending Josh Allen when he was taken down late by Giants edge rusher Lorenzo Carter. You do like to see that. But over the grand scheme of things, those penalties uh, throughout the game by Cody Ford are going to cost us, and he has to minimize those. I do think that Ty Niseki is probably the more ideal starter right now. And my take on Cody Ford is, you know, he's still learning, and he's still, he, he definitely has the talent, but maybe he just needs to be the swing tackle this year. I understand what the Bills coaching staff is trying to do. They want to bring him along. They see the talent, and they think the best teacher is experience. But I also believe that we should be putting our best player out there at all times at that position. And I think Ty Niseki is currently that guy. Uh, Outside of Cody Ford, I do want to touch on the rookies. Uh, Our rookie draft class is looking like it's going to be a really good one uh, so far over two weeks. Uh, Ed Oliver and Devin Singletary have been uh, difference makers out there, both making significant plays over the course of these first two weeks. I thought Oliver had a really good week too. He was... Consistently getting pressure, uh, getting his hand up on a few batted balls. Uh, Devin Singletary looks like he's going to be one of those running back chess pieces out there early in the season. I expect that he's going to get a larger volume of carries and plays designed to him as the season goes on. And then you look at our other third round draft pick, the tight end Dawson Knox. He had a very nice reception this game that we spoke of earlier. He also had an excellent block on the Isaiah McKenzie touchdown. And if you keep going down this draft class, you look at our two seventh round picks. Uh, Tommy Sweeney's contributed, particularly in that week one victory. Uh, Daryl Johnson was getting playing time and making plays in this game against the Giants. He looks like he has a pretty decent NFL career ahead of him. It's very nice to see from a seventh round draft pick. So very impressed with this rookie draft class so far over two weeks. And I think over the past few years, since Brandon Bean has been at the helm, Uh, So far, I'm relatively impressed with his draft classes, and I think these classes are really going to help us uh, set us up to be a perennial playoff contender in the near future. And one last thing I want to mention is Corey Baroquez, our punter. Now, I have been uh, highly critical or highly fearful of our punting situation throughout training camp and the preseason, and I don't think I'm the only one that's been concerned But I think he's uh, settled in pretty nicely here in Buffalo over the first two weeks of the season. Uh, He hasn't really made any egregious errors. He had some really nice booming punts in that week two victory over the Giants. Really helped set us up with some good field position. Uh, He's around middle of the pack right now in terms of average yards per punt. Averaging 45.5 yards which is good for 16th in the NFL. And digging even a little further. Uh, PFF grades Corey Barocas as the fourth best graded punter so far over two weeks in the season. So he's 
definitely alleviated some of my fears coming into the season about our punting situation. But I think the jury is still out about his positional punting. I'm li- I'd like to see a little more to see if he can nail some of those punts within the 20-yard line. He's had a few good efforts so far, but I think uh, some special teams plays by the by our opponents, and in particular in that Giants game, haven't really helped him out in that category. Uh, but I do think that Corey Brokers deserves some props just considering how critical we were about him uh, going into the season. So shout out to him. So let's turn our attention to uh, Week 3's opponent, the Cincinnati Bengals. They are coming into Buffalo as an 0-2 team. The Bills have remained steady six-point favorites in this game over the course of the week. You have in Cincinnati a very frustrated fan base, and for good reason. They've just struggled for so long and haven't really been able to have any kind of regular season or playoff success. Uh, They've made the playoffs a few years over the last decade or so, but they've lost seven straight playoff games. In fact, their last playoff victory was in 1991. Uh, In the offseason, they fired longtime coach Marvin Lewis. They've hired young 36-year-old Zach Taylor to bring in uh, what they hope is a fresh philosophy here, especially on the offensive side of the ball. He is from the Sean McVay tree of coaches. Hard to believe that Sean McVay already has a tree of coaching developing. But that's what happens when you're as successful as early as he has been. And, you know, looking at the start of the season, I think they might have something with Zach Taylor in terms of that offense. They were humming that first game. Andy Dalton played pretty well. It looks like there's a bit of a resurgence happening here with John Ross here. We're going to talk a little bit more about John Ross throughout this podcast. But I still think they're missing quite a few pieces on the offensive line. It's a young offensive line. They lost a lot of players in the offseason to injury and retirements, including Cordy Glenn, the former Buffalo Bill tackle slash guard. Now, the plan here in Cincinnati was to move him inside to guard this season. Uh, he's out with concussion issues. They also lost first round draft pick Jonah Williams, a guy I was a huge fan of and the guy that was supposed to replace Cordy Glenn as the left tackle of this team. He tore his labrum early in the offseason, and he's out for the year. And then on the interior of the offensive line, they lost a few players to retirement, pretty young in their careers, and Clint Bowling and Christian Westerman. Westerman actually had retired and then flip-flopped and came back, but he did not make final cuts. Uh, But what ends up happening here is you have sort of a makeshift offensive line, and it's probably going to be a sore spot throughout this season. Now, they are 0-2, but they did show flashes in that first week playing Seattle really tough. Almost came out with a win there. Couldn't quite hold on. And then in week two, they did not look very good getting blown out by the San Francisco 49ers and another young head coach in Kyle Shanahan, who seems to outsmart, at least on the offensive side of the ball, uh, outsmart his opposition coach in Zach Taylor. So the end result is you have an 0-2 team here that's coming off a blowout loss. Uh, This is a team that, for the third straight week, I can say is uh, less talented than the Buffalo Bills, but they definitely do have some star players out there at certain positions that we're going to talk about uh, when we talk about the keys to victory in a few seconds. You're going to see that I believe we're going to have to scheme to avoid certain players on defense and exploit some of their weak spots and then mitigate the production of a a few players on the offensive side of the ball to make sure we come out of here with a win at home and go up to 3-0 as a football team early in this season. So with that, as we always do on the Build Up podcast, I am going to give you uh, my three keys to victory for the Bills to secure a victory here at New Era Field in their home opener against the Cincinnati Bengals. And to start uh, with the number one key to victory, I think this game is going to rely heavily on the creativity of Brian Dable, our offensive coordinator. I think this year, as compared to last year, we're starting to see more and more of Brian Dable's creativity at work. Consider week two. Well, first of all, that nice jet sweep uh, play call that Josh Allen scored the rushing touchdown on. Then a little later, it was Isaiah McKenzie scoring a touchdown on a fake jet sweep. So he definitely had the Giants off balance there. Now We saw quite a bit of different formations and different motions on the line that I thought really benefited this offense, especially against a younger New York Giants defense. And now looking ahead at the Cincinnati Bengals defense, in week two they had loads of trouble against that Kyle Shanahan zone blocking offense that uses a lot of creativity and movement in that cutback zone scheme. The Bengals really struggled with that, and a lot of that has to do with their extremely weak linebacking core. 
And the centerpiece of the, those linebackers is a former Buffalo Bill, Preston Brown, who I've spoken previously on this podcast. I'm not a player I'm very fond of. I think he's more of a two-down player who really suffers when he has to operate in space. He's just not fast enough and just doesn't have the range to be that guy. And then, watching some of the tape from last week's games versus the 49ers, I saw another linebacker, Nick Vigil, who struggled quite a bit as well. He seems to have some tackling issues, and I believe these two linebackers are going to be starting in this Week 3 matchup. And I think if we can get creative, there's going to be some cutback lanes where we can uh, pull off some big plays and exploit some of the issues that this linebacker core has. And another note I made from this Week 2 Bengals game was that there were quite a few wide-open receivers in the flats. So uh, Kyle Shanahan was doing a really good job of isolating those linebackers on players that they're they're just not going to be able to keep up with. So similarly for the Buffalo Bills, if Brian Dable could implement uh, his trademark creativity here, we're due for uh, some pretty big chunk plays, and I think that's really going to move this offense and put us in a position to score uh, quite a few points if we can do this. In week one, I should note that the Bengals defense actually played fairly well against a a good Seattle offense. I'll allude to this in my second key to victory, but they do have some good pass rushers, so it's not all bad. But I do think uh, what we saw in that 49ers game last week and what the Bills bring to the table in terms of creative play calling is really going to be the the point of emphasis here uh, in terms of the key to victory, uh, an area that we would have to exploit to win this football game. Now, I would have said that uh, Devin Singletary uh, could have an opportunity here to have a real breakout game and maybe even be an ideal fantasy option. But of course, he's dealing with a hamstring injury and it looks like he's going to miss this game. And that's unfortunate for Singletary because I think this would have been a great opportunity for him to break out and really show what he can do, especially in open space. Now, like I said earlier... There are actually some decent players on this Bengals defense that we probably want to uh, try to avoid this game. One of them being cornerback William Jackson. He is quietly becoming one of the better cornerbacks in the league. You don't hear much about him because he plays on this porous Bengals defense. But he can be a bit of a game changer out there. I think Miss Josh Allen would do well to stay away from William Jackson's side of the field and focus on other weaker parts of this defense. Now their other starting cornerback is Dre Kirkpatrick who has struggled immensely over the course of the first two weeks of the season so that's probably an area that we'd want to test rather than William Jackson and uh, it should be noted that the Bengals defense actually played very very well um, week one of the season against the Seattle Seahawks I think they held the Seahawks to approximately 230 yards overall in that game Russell Wilson was contained for the most part they had their pass rush going with uh, Carlos Dunlap and Sam Hubbard both chipping in so it's not like they, they can't play well, and uh, certainly on the pass rush, they have a formidable defensive line with Geno Atkins and those two ends. But really, the, the, the key to victory here is to try to find a ways to limit those good players, and I think the best way to do that is uh, Brian uh, Dable employing some of his trademark creativity and maybe looking at the blueprint that the 49ers used last week uh, to blow out this Bengals football team. Now, the second key to victory... Uh, is really a matchup specific and it's a matchup that that concerns me slightly this one we flip to the other side of the field the defensive side of the field pretty straightforward we have to find a way to stop Bengals wide receiver John Ross from scoring a big play in this game over the course of the first two weeks of the season he's looked like a different player out there under new head coach Zach Taylor Ross already has three touchdowns all three of them being highlight reel plays and Ross is the classic uh, burner wide receiver out there. There's just not many people in the league that can keep up with him. He can blow by defensive backs. So we're going to have to find a game, way to game plan around that. We can't have John Ross running for your breaking uh, many big plays here. Or the Bengals are going to be able to stick around and contend in this football game. Uh, easier said than done, of course. Now We obviously do have two pretty good starting cornerbacks. A pretty good defensive backfield altogether. Leslie Frazier's always found a way to contain our opponent's passing games. Uh, we have that bend but don't break mentality quite often, and I think that's going to lead us, lend us well this game. But we're definitely going to have to put some extra attention on John Ross and just knowing where he is at all times during the football game because all it takes is one lapse in coverage or a split second or so, and John Ross can beat you, and Andy Dalton is starting to show some chemistry with him. It's pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. 
uh, John Ross has to be somehow limited during this football game, and that's going to be a major key to victory. We can't let John Ross take over this football game. Gosh, two weeks ago, I never thought I'd be saying this about John Ross, that he's such a, a vital part of that Bengals game plan, but he certainly looks like he's starting to put it together, and it definitely is worth mentioning here. And now finally for the third key to victory, and this one's going to be fairly similar to our first key to victory where, where I said that we have to get creative on offense and try to exploit certain aspects of that Bengals defense. Now just flipping the tables, I think on the defensive side of the ball, we have to do the same thing. And specifically, we have to exploit that inexperienced and ineffective Cincinnati Bengals offensive line. If we look at this Bengals tackle situation, it's not pretty. In light of the absences of Jonah Williams and Cordy Glenn, they have Andre Smith, the underwhelming veteran out there at left tackle. They've been playing John Jerry at some tackle. I don't know if you all remember him, but he's kind of a journeyman and uh, ineffective uh, guard slash tackle who's more or less in the league because of the scarcity at the position these days. They have Bobby Hart, who they seem to really like. They signed him to a nice contract extension in the offseason but he's never been anything more than a, a below average starter at the left guard spot they have Michael Jordan who has not played like the Bulls Michael Jordan he's a rookie that's really struggled he seems to be injured and will likely miss this week three game actually he has been ruled out I don't know who exactly re is replacing him but it's either going to be John Jerry or uh, Billy Price who was their first round draft selection just a few years ago uh, he hasn't been able to get on the field. He's been struggling with some injuries and perhaps some confidence issues. They do have John Miller at right guard, who's actually played fairly well for them. But as Bills fans are familiar, he's basically your average guard in this league. And their center, Trey Hopkins, has also played well early in this season, uh, ranking as PFF's top-rated center so far. But there are definitely some holes on this offensive line. And we know how Sean McDermott and company like to uh, get creative on the defensive side of the ball about what they show pre-snap, what kind of pressure they bring. And like I've mentioned, Ed Oliver has played pretty well so far early in this season. Veterans Jerry Hughes and Lorenzo Alexander can still bring the heat. There's just a lot of different ways that we can bring pressure this game, and I don't expect our defensive game planners to back down, and that's going to be a major key in this game. Uh, the Bengals' run game has struggled quite a bit so far early in this season, mostly due to the offensive line really not being very adept at run blocking. I think that caters well to our strengths because we've done a